right, we about ready, Brian? All right, well, welcome, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming in after lunch. I know this is the hardest class uh, at any conference to kind of pay attention to because you've just been fed, you're, you're, you're coming in, and now they want you to sit for an hour and learn something. I know this is going to be hard, but I know that the, this opportunity to be together is going to be worth it because we're going to get a chance to kind of look at Jesus with some fresh eyes. In fact, uh, well, first of all, my name is Bill Molden, and uh, I've been an evangelist and teacher in the kingdom of God for almost three decades. Uh, I've raised my daughters, and uh, they are awesome, but that has nothing to do with what I'm after today. Today, I'm actually aiming at your parents. I'm going to be teaching you the things I wish your parents knew. And there might be some things that kind of like where you're at right now, they might be going like, I don't know if that really relates to me. Just say, if you ever feel that way, that, actually, that point wasn't actually for you. That was for your mom and dad. So that's, what I, that's when I want you to write that down and say, I need to share with mom and dad this stuff. But I think most of all, you're going to get a lot out of this time because we're going to talk about following Jesus in real life. I titled it Following Jesus IRL because I didn't want your mom and dad to come. And I knew if they saw some text lingo, they wouldn't, fo they wouldn't bother following you in here. This is for you and your faith, but it's for you and your faith to share with your mom and dad. Okay? Today we're going to be focusing in on the Gospel of John a little bit. Just a couple of stories that I think show and challenge the way we think about Jesus uh, the Gospel of John was actually written to people like you and I. Kind of the first generation of disciples that didn't have eyewitness accessibility to Jesus. John was writing his Gospel at a time when people could only hear about Jesus and then have to decide what they're going to do with what they've heard. And so this Gospel kind of sings a little bit. It kind of it kind of invites us to consider and to understand Jesus in a different way, what if, what if the stories that John records really are the things that will help us to understand Jesus in our day-to-day -day life? And so we're going to be spending time with there because John is asking the question, why Jesus? Why follow him? Of all the influencers that are out there, why let him be the one that's supreme over them? With all the peer pressure and identity things that people are trying to get you to fit into, why would I let Jesus be the one that ultimately decides who I am and what I'm worth? See, that's the cool thing about the Bible. It's not written to people to kind of get them to accept a certain creed. It's actually written for us to kind of wrestle with the real life stuff. Like, I have options. I have the choice, so why should I choose Jesus? And so John handpicked stories that he felt like if they can get this, they can get him. Now, one of the things that I think is exciting is that when, John, when Jesus called John, he was a high schooler. In fact, almost all of the apostles that were called by Jesus were actually called when they were less than 18 years old, except Peter. And you might think to yourself, Bill, how do you know that? Well, in Matthew 17, there's this great need you to do. Go grab a fishing rod. Go down to the stream. Throw a line in. You're going to catch a fish. And that inside that fish is going to be two coins. Just two. And then go pay the tax. Why only two coins? Because the only ones that were over 20 in that group of apostles were Jesus and Peter, which means that Jesus, to change the world, chose people in your age group, which also means that if Jesus had a conference track that he was going to speak at, he would not choose the marrieds, he would not choose the, the older singles, he wouldn't choose forever faithful, he would choose something like this, because if the kids get it, if the kids understand who he really is, 
then they will change the world. And I hope that fires you up a little bit. Let's talk about a couple of stories that I hope are super familiar to you. We're going to be spending some time in John chapter 3, uh, and we're going to talk about two people, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. And so let's start in our journey here and do a little study about Nicodemus. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with them. Jesus re replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, I want to stop for a moment and help us to think about who Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was raised in a very religious family. In fact, he was given a certain script of how to behave. I know you guys can't relate. He was shown what to do and how to do it. He was asked to repeat that behavior over and over again. Nicodemus was one of those kids that was shown the Bible and expected to memorize it. And as he grew in his ability to memorize it, they kept raising him up because he always had the right answers. He knew what to say, when to say it. He knew how to behave. He knew how to treat other adults. And people started lifting this guy up. He got so good at rule keeping that he was identified as someone that could grow up to be a rabbi. So at 15, he was then expected to memorize not only the first five books of the Bible, but a major portion of the book of Isaiah so that he would then be able to then take other teachings of other rabbis and memorize them and become one who could tell other people, this is what you're supposed to do. Here are the rules. Here's how you fulfill the rules. Here's what you do. And he got so good at it that he became big boss man in Israel. He was the top guy. He was, in the, he was part of the Sanhedrin. And he was awesome. He was squeaky clean. He was able to kind of say, hey, been there, done that. Man, try to find some dirt on me. You're not going to find it. I got nothing in my closet because I've never been allowed to have a closet to put something in. I've always followed the rules. I've always been good. And i got to see Jesus because Jesus seems to be doing things weird. He's not holding to our rules. I mean, he is, but he's not holding to them the way I was holding to them. And so he comes to Jesus at night. And I know we make a big deal like, ooh, he didn't want to be seen. Man, he was busy. I mean, try to get some time with some of the people organizing this event. Every time they stop, a line forms. That was Nicodemus' life. Every time he stopped, a line formed, and then he comes to Jesus at night. Probably the only time he could get a chance to himself. He gets to him at night, and he comes to Jesus, and he's impressed. He really kind of goes, but he kind of gives them a used car salesman line there. Did you catch that? Hey, Rabbi, we know that you're a man who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. Did you hear that? Such, that is all true, but I'm trying to figure out, Jesus, where do I stand with you? Jesus turns to him and says, yeah, you need to be born again. Nicodemus, the rule keeper, Needs to be born again. And look at how he responds. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely not, it, they cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Ew. That's just straight up gross, Jesus. What are you talking about? And then Jesus goes on, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying. You should not be surprised at my saying, Nicodemus, you of all people who have tried to hold to the law your whole stinking life should not be surprised at my saying, you of all people need a new start. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's going or where it's coming from. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asks. 
Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things? Oh my gosh, Nicodemus was not ready for this because in real life, he had it figured out. The way you make God happy is that you always obey him and you never disobey. That's how you do it, right? Right? I know you guys have probably never heard that before. The way you make God happy is that you just stick to the rules, do what's right, have the right answer to the right questions, you know? That's what we're supposed to do, right? Is that all God wants? Nicodemus would say, yes! And Jesus is like, nah. <laughs> Woo, Nick, come on, son. You of all people, come on, Israel's teacher. You don't get this. You need to be born again. See, the thing is, is that Nicodemus is kind of doing a dance a little bit. A dance that's hard to diagnose. How many people are in an orchestra have learned a musical instrument of some sort? Yeah, you know, orchestra conductors are kind of like tyrants, aren't they? Like they are always on you to get the music right. You know, there is the ones going, no, my orchestra conductor is awesome. Well, good. But some of them, especially as you get a little bit older, man, they just, they got a little bit of a power trip. There was this one time one or orchestra conductor was kind of having it with his orchestra. He was, he was up to here. They just couldn't get the music right. And in frustration, he says, all right, that's it. This weekend, everyone's got to play this piece record themselves, and turn it in for a grade on Monday. Everyone must do it or you're out of the orchestra. And then there was this one young man who kind of goes, okay, bet, I'm going to do it. And so he goes home and he starts playing and he is focused on the notes, man. He is trying to get it right. But man, the more he plays it, the more he recognizes he keeps messing up. A little too much pressure here. A little too, little too less pressure. And although he was playing it and playing it and playing it, he never got it right. Finally, Sunday comes around, Sunday midnight, and he's still just hacking away at this piece. He can't get it. Every time he tries to do it, he hits record. He's playing and playing. And, oh, he messes up. And then he tries it again. Oh, he messes up again. And so finally, his mom comes up at midnight and says, son, what are you doing? And he's so frustrated and he's howling. He's like, I am trying to get this right. Let me give it one more time. And he plays it. And, he, and mom's kind of going, this is it. This is your last shot. Just turn in what you have. And he plays it and he makes a few mistakes. And he's just, oh, oh. turns it in, B minus. The guy in the chair next to him, who isn't nearly as good of a player, he has the same assignment. And he goes home and he, he's just hacking away at this piece. He's trying his best and he's just playing it and playing it and playing it. And then kind of same thing, Sunday night comes around, mom's going, what is that racket? And mom goes up and kind of says, son, it's midnight. You have got to stop playing. Why? Well, oh, oh, wait, I totally forgot. I got to record. I got to record me playing and turn it in. And so, so, so mom, but I need you to listen. Just listen to this. And he has his mom sit down and he starts to play. And he makes a few mistakes. <laughs> but he plays and plays and he finishes it. And he says to his mom, I know I messed up a few times, but isn't it beautiful? To which she said, of course, it is beautiful. Turns it in, B minus. Same assignment, two completely different experiences. Most of you look at following Jesus like the first violin player. You're so focused on the notes that you can't hear the music. The best any of us could do might be a B minus. But man, if you do not hear more than just the notes you're trying to play and doing exactly what you're supposed to do, you could miss the beauty of the music. 
And I think this is all over scripture when you, when you, when you think about it. Think about Luke 15, right? You know, the whole chapter is amazing. You know, you have this, uh, this incredible series of stories. You have a sheep that is lost, and what happens? The sheep gets found. Thank you very much for playing. And after he gets found, what happens? He calls his friends and neighbors together, and they, they throw a party. Right, they celebrate. And Jesus says, that's a, you know, and they celebrate, and that's exactly what we do in heaven. And then a coin gets lost, and then it gets found. And what do they do? Celebrate. And Jesus goes, exactly. That's what we do in heaven. That's how it goes down on the other side of this reality. And then the sun, the sun doesn't get doesn't wander off or get mishandled. He actually dives into sin. He goes out and is super rebellious. Dad, you're dead to me. You've heard this at camp, right? You know, he comes to his senses and then he comes back. And what does dad do? Throws a party. Not just a party. He slaughters a whole cow. How many people can a whole cow feed? A lot of people. He is going to extra villages to say, my son was lost, but now he's found. He's dead. He's now alive. Let's throw a party. But most of us, most of us don't know that God. You serve a party God. Can I get a witness but most of us don't see that God. We're like the older brother. We're the older brother standing outside. Inside there's dancing, there's music, there's laughter, there's food, and the older brother is outside missing it all. He can't hear it. He's focused on the notes. And look at what the older brother says. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Did you see that? How did he view his relationship with his father? He thought the only thing my dad wants is for me to slave for him and never disobey him. Slaving and never disobeying. Is that what you think God wants from you? No way. He wants you to hear the music. <laughs> he wants you to know that there is a party for one of you. If one of you repents today, there is a party in heaven. That's what he's like. So what must heaven be like? Boring, kind of a bunch of... <laughs> no, I mean, it literally is something that is happening all the time, including at an event like this where you might hear something, get moved by something, and start making a decision towards something. And God goes, yes, that's worth throwing a party for. Unfortunately, when we don't see God right, we're the older brother who's left out in the dust, missing the party. Because there will always be a war within if you think it's all about doing things right. How many people have gone through or started or maybe started a few times the, the character studies? Yeah, those are incredibly helpful tools. How many of you have ever looked at the character of God? Yeah, because it's not the same study series, is it? You know, one, one study series focuses on how you should be honest but have you ever stopped to think those same scriptures also reveal how honest God is? I mean, think about it. I mean, we know about everyone's mess up. We know about, we know about uh, people that were prostitutes. We know about David's abuse of power. We know about adulteries. We know about things that would be rated R if they were made into movies. And these are God's people. God is incredibly honest. And yet, these are the ones he says... Through you, I will change everything. When you think about God, you know, you, your need to be righteous, you ever thought about what God calls righteous? I mean, the first time God calls someone righteous, remember, it's Abraham. 
And Abraham is kind of this old, crusty dude. He's too old to have kids. His wife is used up and dried up. She's no good for that sort of thing anymore. And God goes, yep, you're the one, Abram. I'm through you. I'm going to build a whole nation. You go have a baby. And he goes, okay, whatever. And so he starts following, but then there's no baby. And he gets frustrated. And he starts having a fit with God. He has a fit with God. God comes to him one night and says, you know, do not fear Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Abram's response is, where's my kid? The only one to inherit all this is the son of my servant. Is he going to get it all? You promised me a kid. I started following you. And here we are so many years later, and I ain't got no kid. And, Abr- and God, in his great patience, says, come with me, son. Takes him outside and says, look at the stars. You're worried about one, I'm going to show you what I'm thinking of, millions. I just need you to believe. And Abraham does this amazing thing. He says, okay, it's in the Bible. And God goes, that is righteous. Think about that for a moment. That is righteous righteousness. Nicodemus wasn't quite that way. Nicodemus felt what what Paul felt. You remember, have you ever read Romans 7? It's that great chapter where Paul's having an identity meltdown. The good I want to do, this I don't do, and the bad I don't want to do, this I keep doing. Every time I want to do good, evil's right there and doesn't let me do good. And because I, because I want to do good, there is a law coming at me. And in fact, you know, he kind of comes to this point. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work and in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. What a wretch. Every time I try to do good, I end up doing bad. And the good I want to do, I don't do. And the bad I don't want to do, this is what I keep on doing. It's like I have a bipolar personality right here when it comes to spirituality. I know the good I ought to do. I know all the rules. But then the law said, don't covet. And now all I want to do is covet. It's like when you go to that purity devotional and and they said, okay, we all got to be pure. And the first thing you want to do is be impure. You know what I'm saying? It's that realistic thing that says, now that I know that's the rule and these are the rules and I'm a good rule keeper. If that's what you think God wants, God, it's so easy. That war, that divided self comes and he finally just gets to the point where he says, what a wretched man I am. And then watch the brilliance here. Who? Who? will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Not what? A who will deliver, not what you have to do. And sometimes, guys, as kingdom kids, as good kingdom kids, you study the Bible looking for a what. What do I have to say? What do I have to do? How do I have to behave? If I do that, am I ready? Is that what it takes to be a disciple? Just knowing enough right answers? Behaving in a certain way? Or is it really a who? Because in real life, you're always going to be challenged relationally. There's got to be a relationship, not a code of ethics. Because the the behavior will come when you have a relationship with who, when you see Jesus is a good enough reason to say no to sin. Because as it stands right now, if you went to your school friends and kind of did a comparison of those who do right and those who do wrong, you're probably some of the best people you know. You're the best behaved, you're the most polite, you're the most agreeable, you're the ones that are probably easiest to get along with everywhere you go, and yet somehow you don't feel like you're ready to follow Jesus. Why? Because the rules just keep seeming to get stacked. That's why it's not a what will rescue me. It's got to be a who. Are you guys with me right here? Because there is this great conclusion to the story with Nicodemus. 
and listen to your God's heart as you hear these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear. Their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what, is, what they have done has been done in the sight of God, that it may be seen plainly. See, God loves so much that he's willing to become a who. And not just a rule-giving entity that says, if you do this, you are in my favor. But if you don't do this, you are no longer in my favor. He says, let me come and walk with you. There's this great moment in, in Revelation that I just think everyone needs to hear at least once in their life. It's the Christmas story from heaven's point of view. It's Revelation 12. It literally is the Christmas story. It talks about how Mama Israel is all full of child and she's about to give birth. And then you see this dragon come in and this dragon is there to devour the child. So imagine how vulnerable and weak, you know, Israel and the, and the future king to be is there. And there's a dragon about to pounce. He's about to devour the child. The woman can't do anything. She's, she's about to give birth. She gives birth and somehow the dragon misses. He misses a newborn child, completely blows his opportunity. He misses it, and the child is whisked away by God's power and authority, and he's saved. And then the next paragraph says, and then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Wow. Now that's a Christmas story I could get fired up about. I think... This year, in your nativity scene, you should add a dragon. Can I get a witness? Come on, Lord of the Rings people, let's go. You know, yeah, I, I feel you, dog. Yeah, I mean, that would be awesome. But think about this. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. Who was not fighting the dragon? Who was, who, what was that? God. Where was God? There was a war in heaven. What? what? It's almost like God said, hey, Mike, can you go take care of that little lizard for me? The dragon and all the angels that were with him were not a good enough reason to get off the throne. The rebellion in heaven was not a good enough reason for him to, to take off his robes and say, let's get down to business, devil. It wasn't worth it to him. But you know what was worth leaving all the glory and majesty of heaven? You are. You're worth abandoning the abode of heaven. Your soul, your heart, your, your being, everything, every goofy thing about you, God adores and wants to take that goofiness and say, I'm going to introduce you to a lot of other people just as goofy and weird as you, and together as a mixed bag of fruit and nuts, we're going to change everything under the dragon's power. We are going to liberate because that's how I like to do it. He's a who that thinks you're worth leaving heaven for. And all he requires is, let's be honest, step into the light. Step into the light. Rule keepers don't do that very easily. Because you have to admit, even though you know the rules, you don't keep them very well. But then again, that kind of makes you like Paul. That kind of makes you like Nicodemus. Let's just not be the older brother that misses out on the party. Don't miss 
the music. Because there's another story that I want to introduce you to, and you probably already know it. And that's the story of the woman at the well. This is over in John chapter 4. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, now he, that's Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well, uh, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, I know when we read that, we don't go, ooh, but we really should. Because wells in the Bible, that's where you went to go pick up girls. That's where they went. That was the club back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, this is where all the betrothal scenes happened in the Old Testament. This is where Abraham's servant found, found Rebekah for his son Isaac. You know, this is where Jacob met Rachel. Uh, this is where uh, Moses met his future wife Zipporah. And they all have the same pattern. You know, a foreigner goes to, uh, goes to a new plot of land. He travels to the well. He meets a young woman there. They, he goes and meets the family. And there is a marriage arranged there. That's where you went to go pick up girls. And Jesus is a foreigner in this story, is he not? He's in Samaria. He's in the wrong place. He's a Jew. He's supposed to be on the other side of the Jordan, but he's in the wrong area. He's a foreigner at a well alone, and here comes a woman. This is spicy. This is dangerous. This is like one of those things that people reading this in the first century say, what's Jesus doing over there with a girl? And who is this girl that he's talking to? And he initiates, this is the pickup line. Guys, if you're looking to kind of connect with a sister, you might want to try this. Got anything to drink? You know, I mean, come on now. Not the smoothest thing I've ever heard, but it worked back then. So, so listen to what happens. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For, for Jews did not associate with Samaritans. I love how John leaves it very sensitive. Forget the fact that Jesus is literally using the oldest pickup line in history. He's saying on top of this weirdness, we have a racial issue happening here this is dicey as dicey can get jesus is doing this all wrong and this woman i mean come on guys we're about to hear all about her testimony but can you imagine what we already know at this point of this woman it's noon that's not when young women went to go get water they always went in the morning or at the evening because it was hot She's going at noon. Why? Because that's the only time she feels like she could do it alone. Every time she's around other people in the village, she feels ashamed. Not only is she going at noon, she's going to a well which isn't even as close to her village as another well. We know from recent excavations of this area. There's actually a well much closer to her village than the one that she's going to. She's going to the wrong well during the middle of the day when it's the hottest and there is a guy. And she's seen this play out before. Listen to the story again. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as, do, as did his kids or his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. Go call your husband 
and come here. Remember the pattern? Young man goes to a foreign country, meets a woman at a well, and asks to meet, his, meet her family. Jesus bypassing dad, he knows how old this girl is. And he also knows he's thirsty in the slang way. She's thirsty. Go call your husband. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Ha <laughs> ha, you're right in saying you, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is, is not your husband. What you have said is true. Whoa, Jesus. <laughs> oh my gosh. Talk about confront of, I mean, he just exposes her for everything. This woman, now again, there, we don't know the full story. She probably, like most of us said, I'm going to do everything right, and everything's going to work out fine, and she met her prince, and then he, she married him, and then for whatever reason, it didn't work, and, she, and he left her. And by doing so, took with her every bit of dignity that she could muster. Who wants a used product? In this age. And the world was the same then as it is now. She's left with a choice. In order to find love, I guess I have to go and use sex. And the men were more than willing to accommodate them because they'll use love in order to get sex, right? And that's exactly what she has lived through. Not once, not twice, but five times. In fact, the guy she's now shacked up with doesn't even have the decency to put a ring on it. And Jesus is like going, come on. I want you to step into the light. I, I, I don't want anything to be in the darkness because, again, if we leave anything in the darkness, it becomes about what we have to do instead of who you're following. I need you to talk to me about what's really going on with you, woman. I know you're thirsty, and that's exactly why I'm asking you for water because I want to give you something that can quench that thirst, not just for you, but for everyone. Come on, will you talk with me? The man I have isn't my husband. He goes, you're, you're, you said it. And then the woman responds, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem, as a Jew, the place I, where people ought to, uh, Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You know, we've read this thing wrong for years. We look at this and go, see, that's what happens when you get real with people. They get all religious you know what she's actually saying? She's actually saying, I'm in a tough spot. I can't worship with my people because everyone knows about my past. I don't belong there. I can't go worship there. I can't go with you because you're a Jew, and all you Jews say you got to worship in Jerusalem. What? Where's God for me? What happens if I cross that line? What happens if I've blown it? And, and, and following all the rules. What happens if I bought into the world and the world used me up and now here I am at noon walking to a faraway well to try to get away from men and here you are, a single guy, talking to me about water. Where does someone like me worship? She's asking desperately, can I be accepted without being able to behave right? And it's important that we get this one because we live a lot of times with a lot of shame when it should only be guilt. Do you know the difference between guilt and shame? Guilt is when you do something dumb and you behave badly and you know it and you kind of go, yeah, I did a bad thing. Shame is when that becomes, I am bad. And that just proves it. She was living in shame. And a lot of kingdom kids deal with this, and you get it wrong. Because for some of you, what's stopping you from making the leap to just following Jesus is this fear of, I don't want to let God down. 
I don't want to let my parents down. I don't want to let the ministry down. I don't want to let, you know, you got your whole list of things. I don't want to disappoint them. And I got to tell you, and you need to hear me here, you can't let God down. You want to know why? You never held him up. You can't let your parents down. You want to know why? Because you're not holding them up. You can't let the church down. You want to know why? You're not lifting up the church. That's all God's job. So stop living in this idea that I am not good, that I am not worthy, that I am not this. And I tell you, if you've ever thought about hurting yourself, this is why. You've gone past guilt and you've fallen into shame. But I'm telling you, if you just get back to the things that I might have done some things wrong, but there is grace. Guilt plus grace leads to great change. Guilt without grace leads to shame. And shame loses its footing and falls from its place of influence in your life when it is revealed and rejected. This is why God says, those who step into the light, those who step into the light experience the who of God. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is of the Jews. I mean, Jesus had to throw it in there, right? But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father. The true worshipers will worship the Father. Whose Father? Her Father. His Father. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. You remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus that this whole thing is like wind? This whole spirit thing? You know why that was tough for Nicodemus? Because as a rule keeper, it was all about knowledge and control. For this woman, there's no mention of when. It's just the fact that God, this uncontrollable, relentless, loving God is seeking you. And I need you to be full of truth about what, what you're, what's going on in your life, how you're thinking about him. I want you to bring it up. I want you to bring it to me. I want you to ha- experience the grace that comes and so that we can break the shame cycle. I want you to know the truth, not because you're saying the right things, because you're experiencing what is right. You are worthy of his absolute best. And he is just asking you to give it back to him by being transparent and trying to be open and just playing the music because playing the playing the instrument because the music's just so beautiful. Are you with me here? He goes on to say, "I know that the Messiah who is coming will tell us all things." Jesus said to her, looking her right in the eye, "I who speak to you am he." Let me ask you a few questions as we close out. What surprised or impressed you most about Jesus? Let's just call it out. Yeah, just I can't see you, so you just got to say it. Amen. Amen. And so if you share, you got to use your preacher voice. So speak loud. Let's have, let's have one more. We have more questions. Anyone else? Okay, next question. What would it look like if you lived as though there was no favor line? You know what I mean by favor line? That's that line that we draw in the sand and we kind of do something good. I had a quiet time today. I'm in God's favor. I actually cleaned the dishes after I had breakfast. I'm really in God's favor. I went to school and had a good attitude. That's a miraculous sign of the Holy Spirit. I actually came home and did my homework. I am in God's favor. But what happens is that a lot of times 
we, we tried to have a, well, I tried to have a quiet time and I didn't do a good job and I barely read. And then as soon as my mom asked me to do something, I totally gave her attitude and I didn't want to do it. And then I got to school and there was that girl who said that thing and there was that guy who was, oh man, he's going to get it. I had to pump up on it, you know. And then all of a sudden you're doing this stuff and all of a sudden you create this dance where you're trying to stay in God's favor. What would it look like if there was no line? If you just knew, it's about the relationship. And if I do something good, God loves me. And if I mess up and do something bad, God's got me. What would it look like? Let's just kind of skip over that one for now. Is there anything you feel like you need to bring into the light? Don't share unless you're ready to do that. That was for the way home. Which part of the lesson do you feel your parents might need to hear? And that's the one I want to camp out on as we close out here. Is there any part of this that you feel like, my mom and dad might be helped if they understood this? No one wants to put their parents on blast? Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Got to live my life not trying to make my parents happy. You're not going to let them down. You're not holding them up. That's God's job. So therefore, let's take that pressure off of us. Anything else? What's that? Step into the light. Let's keep it real. We're following Jesus in real life, not trying to manufacture some righteousness. All right. Yeah, there was someone back there. My, my daughter's pointing. Yes! Yes! Yeah, you know what Jesus calls that, stepping into the light, which is exactly what he's inviting you to do. It's great to doubt. He's not insecure. He's not going to kind of, what, you're doubting me at the moment? He actually summons it. Let's bring it out. Let's talk about it. But by all means, keep, slow down the process, but keep asking the questions. All right, well, gang. Uh, I think I'm at the end of my time here. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for paying attention.